have a brand new series that we are kicking off called The Dove, and of course because of uh, the, uh, the song that we're singing and making that a part of the month, and of course that teaching that we just recognize all of the symbolism of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, um, that's, that's the thinking behind what we're going to learn over the next uh, several weeks together. Uh, just a couple of things really quickly. I just want to make sure you know how important this is in the life of the church. 21 days of prayer, and of course I always during this season... Uh, fast. I'm not calling everyone to join me in that. Um, Ashley lovingly refers to this season because we have prayer and fasting in January. Uh, my bride calls this prayer and feasting. That's what she calls this season. And so no expectation, but I would say this. Um, it would probably be wise of you to lay some things aside during these 21 days that could potentially be a distraction to actually hearing the voice of God more clearly. And if you have any questions on what that might be, I, I would be like, oh, well, maybe it's like uh, social media. What if you laid that down for 21 days? Could that potentially be a distraction? What Netflix, maybe you don't need to binge anything in 21 days. And maybe just the scrolling needs to go away for the next 21 days. I, I'm, I know some of you will say this is heresy. Maybe Fox and CNN need to go away for the next 21 days. I'm telling you, listen to me, it will be there 21 days from now. And they will be saying the same thing they're saying tomorrow. They will be wearing you out with their rhetoric. And there's something about this laying it down that brings a peace to your soul. So I'm just recommending maybe even in the midst of prayer and just plan on 6 a.m. I cannot wait for the largest crowd that's ever showed up on the first Monday of 21 days. Tomorrow morning, I'm speaking my faith. 6 a.m., I will see you here. And everyone said, okay, all right, I'm holding you to it now. Now, Wednesday night... We'll keep Wednesday night in play because some of us can't join the 6 a.m. And I, I've already told you this, but maybe uh, for those that are interested, I'm going to continue pressing more deeply and teaching on the Holy Spirit on Wednesday nights for our nights of prayer uh, gatherings together. So make sure you join us for that. And then on the prayer request side of things, they're on um, your, your seats. You can also do it online. But if you've been a part of 21 Days, you know that these are critical and integral to these seasons because we pray over those requests every day. And so you can be as specific as you want. You can include as many details as you want on that request, but they will be lined all across this platform, and every day they will be prayed over during the 21 days. How many would like someone joining their faith with yours on the thing that's most pressing on your mind and heart? And we want to do that, so just allow us into that space. And then finally, we have a new soap guide that's available for this series, and of course, all of the readings will align with the weekends. Um, for those of you that are guests, we have a scripture reading plan, very simple, one chapter a day. We cover them on the weekends, and then you read through them during the week. And because we're learning more about the Holy Spirit, I would really recommend if you've never tried soaping before, scripture, observation, application, prayer, I would recommend this be the season that you try it because you won't be sorry that you do. And everyone said, amen. amen. All right. We're in week one of this series where we're talking about something that's honestly probably caused more controversy and confusion and debate and disagreement in the church more than any other topic. I mean, entire denominations have begun around the idea of the role of the Holy Spirit and the role that he plays in our lives. And so my hope, as I've been praying for you and leading up to this series, is that you would experience the Holy Spirit in a fresh way and encounter him in ways that maybe you had never encountered him before. And so you're soaping through Luke chapter 3 today. And of course, it is the familiar story of Jesus being baptized. I referenced it earlier. But he, this is the phrase I could not get over. I could not get past this phrase because I think this is the phrase that I'm so believing for you. And that is that you would allow the Holy Spirit to descend on you. Yeah. <laughs> that you would allow him places in your life that maybe you've never allowed him to go before. That he would descend on you and settle on you and that you would invite him to relate to you. Because here's what I've seen in experience. When, when we look to scripture to actually learn about who the Holy Spirit is and the role that he plays, quite often it's different than the person that we were told he was. And it's different than what maybe was modeled for us in our church context. And what I'm asking you to do is to actually set aside any preconceived idea that you have about the Holy Spirit. And if you just be willing to start with a blank page for the next few weeks. Because I want you to learn what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Now here's what I want you to also understand. The Holy Spirit is not weird. 
people are weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. Even I'm weird sometimes, but the Holy Spirit is never weird. And there have been some weird things that have been done that the Holy Spirit's name has been stamped on. And we've seen people who talk about the Holy Spirit and they're weird. But can I tell you, it wouldn't matter what they're talking about, they would still be weird. <laughs> People's weirdnesses don't make the Holy Spirit weird. And I think right from the get-go, you need to understand, you can be a normal person and have the person of the Holy Spirit living and active in your life. You do not have to be weird, goofy, spooky, kooky, or mystical to have the Spirit of God active in your life. Now, it is supernatural, so now you're on this journey of discovering who he is. And I just believe that if you are correctly framed in accordance to Scripture who the Holy Spirit really is, you'll only want more of him. Maybe for some of you, you grew up in environments where they never even talked about this. You were okay with two-thirds of God. And you were like, holy what? No, we ain't talking about that. And maybe they avoided this topic and maybe they, they intentionally stayed away from it. Can I tell you, you're not alone in that. Even Christians, disciples in Scripture, were unfamiliar and ignorant to the things of the Holy Spirit. You're going to soak through this later this week on Thursday in Acts chapter 19 when Apollos was at Corinth. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there Paul found some, watch, disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they were like, no, what are you talking about? And that word heard in the original language means they didn't have an understanding or a comprehension. And some of us, we've been resistant to something that we don't even have an understanding or comprehension about. And what you need to understand is the Holy Spirit's chief desire, listen to me, is relationship with you, to encourage you, to guide you as a trusted friend. So my hope, my prayer is that over the next several weeks, you not only gain clarity about what we believe as a church in accordance to the Holy Spirit, but what you can experience, who he is, his role in your life, what he promises to do in your life. So I just a couple things you need to know about the Holy Spirit, I want to introduce you to him, and he is a person. You need to understand that. Um, because if you don't approach him as a person, you won't personally relate to him. Jesus would say this in John 14, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, speaking of the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. And the Spirit of truth he is that. The world cannot accept, watch this, him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. He is a person. And the reason, again, that I'm emphasizing that is if you see him as an it or a cosmic mystical force, you will not relate to him as a person. He is the person of the Holy Spirit who wants a personal relationship with you. And a lot of us have experienced and viewed the Holy Spirit as something that's only an encounter, one-off kind of thing, but doesn't have an ongoing interaction with us. In fact, some of us have limited the Holy Spirit to just certain environments, and we've determined that it only has to look a certain way when he's present or sound a certain way when he's present. And the Holy Spirit is not something you experience. He is a person you relate to. So he's not just something that happens to you. He is a person who is with you. That changes everything. So now I'm developing a relationship with him because he is a person. And here's the other thing you need to know. He's my friend. <laughs> and he wants to be yours. And I want that for you so badly. And some of us, maybe we've limited our relationship with him based upon our preconceived notions or maybe what we've experienced in the past. And it's very important that you understand the role of the unique Godhead, the Trinity, three in one, because I think a lot of us are okay with God the Father and we're okay with God the Son, Jesus. You received everything that he did for you on the cross. You, you just don't know the, know the fullness of what the Holy Spirit can be bringing into your life. And you've honestly been okay with it. And Paul actually prays a prayer in 2 Corinthians, where we get the roles of the uniqueness of the Godhead in one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, watch this, 
Paul would say, the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus paid the debt for our sin. He stepped in, paid the bill. We get washed clean so that we can experience and have a relationship with and experience the love of the heavenly father. He reconciles us back to the father. He bridges the gap, a love beyond our comp- comprehension, a love so extravagant that he was willing to sacrifice his own son to provide it. But the reality is, until we see our Heavenly Father face to face, we're going to need some help while we're still down here on earth. Come on now. Guess who provides that help? The third person of the Trinity. And it's in knowing Him and pursuing a friendship with Him where I get to actually experience the third part, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. To which you might think, yeah, but... Devin, if I get close to him and he becomes my friend, isn't that when the crazy stuff happens? Isn't that when people start calling me a Pentecostal? Now, some of you say that and you don't even know what a Pentecostal is. I mean, you have an idea. But listen, Pentecost is a holiday that Jewish people celebrate The giving of the Ten Commandments. So guess what? We're all Pentecostals. We all celebrate that and we're thankful that God delivered the law through Moses. So it's it's a day. That's why it says in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came. Pentecost is not a religion. It is not a denomination. Pentecost is a day, and pente means 50, so Pentecost is simply 50 days after Passover. That's all it is. So what they would be celebrating is the law of God being given on that day, and as they were celebrating that day in Acts, that's what they would have been celebrating. They would have been celebrating Pentecost. We find some similarities between what happened in the Old Testament, what they were celebrating, and the new expression of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament, a cloud descended with loud sound and fire. That'll sound familiar in the New Testament. And God wrote his law on tablets of stone. And in Acts chapter 2, they're celebrating and commemorating that And at the same time, the Holy Spirit descended, see if this doesn't sound familiar, with a loud sound and fire. But instead of tablets of stone, God wrote his law on our hearts. And that really is the major difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. One is an external happening and the other is internal. And God knew that he was going to need more than rules and regulation to get accomplished what he wanted to accomplish in people's lives. He knew that he was going to need the Holy Spirit to actually change our hearts. And later in the same chapter of Acts chapter 2 of them experiencing this, watch what it says. Oh, what in the world is going on? They're like, what does this mean? What does the day of Pentecost mean for us today? Here's what I believe it means. I, I mean that... I think it means that without an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's not going to be real change. Yes, we need rules. Yes, we need reform. Yes, we need laws. But listen, those things never change the hearts of men. The Holy Spirit and God's work in people is what changes the hearts of mankind. And you need an outpouring of his Holy Spirit. So I'm just asking you, blank page, no preconceived notion, what does the Bible say about the person of the Holy Spirit? And Jesus actually gave us five things that the Holy Spirit would accomplish in our lives if we would let him descend on us. (laughs) Now, if Jesus says there are things that the Holy Spirit wants to provide for us. How many, do you want to trust Jesus with that? I think I I would. So just to give you some context, the gospel of John records the longest conversation that Jesus has on the topic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, If you're familiar with the story, John 13, 14, 15, and 16, uh, most theologians believe it's the last conversation that he would have with his disciples. This is literally 12 to 15 hours before he would go to the cross. Jesus partakes of the Passover meal. He washes the feet of the disciple. He's, he, disciples, he's betrayed by Judas after Judas leaves. Peter, he tells them, you're going to deny me three times. And then he starts to press in on this conversation. 
John chapter 14. Now, I am so excited for you to read through this this week. You're reading through John 14, 15, 16 on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. And I cannot wait for you to see what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. But watch, here's where the conversation starts. Matthew, (laughs) sorry, Thomas, which, you know, I feel sorry for Thomas because he's always asking the dumb question. But he says, because Jesus is like, I got to go away. And Thomas is like, well, what are we going to do? How do we know where we're going to go? And Jesus actually answers this question by talking about the Holy Spirit. He gives direction of who he is and what he provides in their lives. And what's interesting to me is that Jesus takes the opportunity, his last moments with the disciples, and the thing he wants to talk about the most is the person of the Holy Spirit. Five times Jesus says, and he will, meaning he will provide these things in your life if you invite him, embrace him, welcome him, and allow him to send upon you. John 14, verse 16 Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, that's the word that Jesus most often used in describing the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, other translations might say advocate, helper, consoler. Some even say friend. But he he most often used comforter, that he may abide with you, that he will be with you. You, he will abide. He will be with you. And every one of these five are framed in prayer form. And I'm just asking you, would you invite the Holy Spirit to descend upon you and then just pray, Holy Spirit, comfort me. That's what he wants to do. Now, it's one of the places in the translation that's really difficult because we didn't have one English word that can fully entail all that the word meant. In the original language that it's written in, it, it's this word parakletos. You might have heard it pronounced paraclete, and here's, here's what it means. Alongside, and kletos means to come, meaning Jesus says, I'm going to send someone who's going to come right alongside you to help you and counsel you, and he wants to be with you forever. Uh, we have um, two dogs in our, in our household uh, one uh, loves me and one loves Ashley. And now that our daughter is getting ready to leave for college, they both think that they're supposed to sleep with us now because they have historically been in our daughter's room. And my dog is a dog by the name of Lila. Best dog ever. She's a little overweight right now. But I love her to death. She's the best. She's, she's a chihuahua. But she's a Mexican dog, but she's a French kisser. I mean, she's like all up. Like, even if you're holding her out here, she's literally trying. She's like, I, I'm trying to get you, you know. But when Lila crawls up in bed with me, she literally presses up against me. And because she is a little overweight, once she settles in, there's no moving her. She's like, this is where I'm staying. And this is going to sound really weird to you, but because I know this about the Holy Spirit, this is going to sound really strange. Every time Lila presses up against me, I have this thought, the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what he wants to do in my life. He wants to press up against me and be with me and be with me forever. Pressed up against, he does not want to move. He wants to be that close to me. It literally, here's what it literally means. Someone who has a calling to stand right beside you all the time forever who wants to come alongside you and never leave you. And the picture, the, the, the alliteration is this, that if you were to go pick up one end of the log, the picture is, Paracletos is, they will always pick up the other end of the log. That's the picture. Every time you're facing something that you need help with, He comes alongside, and he picks up the other side, and he goes, I'm never leaving you. I'm with you. I'm alongside you, and I will pick up the other side every time. The Holy Spirit, that's what he wants to provide in your life. He's not just for church services. He's with you for all of time. He wants to be with you not only here, but when you leave here, right by your side, pressing up against you. And Jesus said, I'm going to send you someone, an advocate, a friend, a consoler, a counselor, an intercessor, a comforter who wants to come alongside and pick up the other end every time you need him to. 
Which is why when Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit, he would say, he's going to bring peace. Peace. He said, I'm going to leave, but you're going to have peace. How? Through the person of the Holy Spirit. My peace I'm giving you. I don't give to you as the world gives. The world cannot give you peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. But the reason our hearts are troubled and afraid is because we're looking for the world to provide peace. And we need the Holy Spirit providing peace. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, I'm hoping you pray it. Descend on me. Bring your peace and your comfort to my life. Bring peace to my troubled mind and comfort my, my anxiety and comfort the worry. He's present. He's with you. He's abiding. Back to John 14. I cannot wait for you to read it on Friday. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... Watch this now. He will. Here's the second time. He will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I've said to you. Now, I try to be a teacher. I try to explain things. I try my best. But can I tell you, my best is not enough. The best teacher you could ever have is the person of the Holy Spirit. And listen to me. You need him teaching you. So here's the second prayer. Not only Holy Spirit, comfort me. Holy Spirit, teach me. And of course, the best way that we're taught by the Holy Spirit is through the book that the Holy Spirit wrote, the Bible. And you're like, no, men wrote the Bible. No, men held the pen, but the Holy Spirit inspired every word they wrote. All scripture is breathed by God. And is useful what? To teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. Have you ever been reading the word and the Holy Spirit goes, there's something wrong? Am I the only one? You are reading the Bible, right? I'm just trying to help you out a little bit here. That's part of his role. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. And watch, he's not only just correcting you, he wants to prepare you and equip you for the work that he's called you to do. Did you know that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring revelation to the word of God, to help you understand scripture better? We call it revelation. He reveals all truth. How how many of you have ever been reading scripture? Beyond our soap reading, I read the proverb every day of whatever day it is, and I read through the book of Proverbs 12 times a year because I read it Once a month, the entire book. So the most marked book in my Bible is the book of Proverbs. And I said it to Ashley not too long ago. I was reading the book of Proverbs. I came across a verse I've read a thousand times, at least a thousand times. And the Holy Spirit revealed something to me that I'd never seen in Scripture. Have you ever had that happen to you? And you're thinking, I've read this a million times. How did I not see this before? It's because the Holy Spirit knew that you were at a place for him to reveal something about this God-inspired word of God. He brings revelation to it, and now it can be applied and active in your life in a way that it was never before. The Holy Spirit, 1 John 2 says, he's the best teacher you could have. And I, here's what I get to see. I get to see it all the time. Light bulb moments for y'all. I see it all the time. You're like, oh my goodness, I never thought of that. I never. And you come and tell me in the lobby. And here, here's what you say Were you reading my journal this week? That's what, <laughs> you were on the phone call with me. Someone's been telling you what's going on in my life. Who's telling you what's going on in my life? And I'm going, the Holy Spirit. He's been in all those places. He's talking to you. He loves you that much. In fact, sometimes he'll say something that I don't even say. I have people come to me and go, man, my favorite part was when you said this. And I'm like, I never said that. (laughs) I know what I said. Who did say it? The Holy Spirit. He's a revealer of truth. The Holy Spirit helps me. He reveals things to me. And the best way to get to know him is to read the book that he wrote. For the word of God is alive. It's powerful. Sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Watch. Cutting between soul and spirit. Between joint and marrow. And it exposes some things. My innermost thoughts and being. Wow. What if I started praying? Holy Spirit, start revealing some things to me. Expose my thoughts. I need to know something. Teach me. It's his role in your life. He wants to comfort you. He wants to teach you. Now, you're going to soak through this on Saturday. So this is John 15 now. We're moving through this night. 
And when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, watch this, he will, this is the third time he says it, he will testify, Jesus says, about me. Another translation would say he will bear witness about me. In other words, he's going to give you the words to say to other people, especially people that don't know God. Let me say it a different way. He will use you. And he will speak through you if you will let him. What did Jesus tell the disciples in Mark chapter 13? He says, when they arrest you, you will start saying things that aren't your words, but it's the Holy Spirit speaking through you. And those of you that are seeking the Holy Spirit have had that moment. So what's the prayer? Oh, comfort me. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Empower me. Equip me. Use me. I want to be your mouthpiece to testify about the goodness of God. The Holy Spirit wants to empower believers to be effective on the mission. What's the mission? Our mission on earth, this may shock you, is not to have church services and then barely make it through a week and then show up and go, Devin, you got to get me through another week, buddy. That's not our mission. Our mission is one thing, and that is win people to Jesus because heaven and hell are a reality, and the Holy Spirit, listen, is very concerned with people's eternity. And it's his presence in your life speaking through you, giving you words of hope, giving you words of life. I mean, do you honestly think that the Holy Spirit would baptize you simply for you to get a gift that doesn't result in anyone's eternity changing? Do you think that's why he would bless you with that gift? Just for you to have a feel-good moment? I mean, do you remember the early church? When the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire, what happened? Oh, they had a feel-good moment and got goosebumps. No, 3,000 people got saved. The sick were healed. Demons were getting cast out. Acts 17 said they flipped the world upside down, empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's about souls. It's about people. It isn't about an experience only for you. So many people make the Holy Spirit about something so selfish for them. The Holy Spirit is not a self-serving thing. He is a person you relate to that wants to empower you to reach the lost. God wants to empower you. The Holy Spirit is not some form of spiritual entertainment. He wants to empower you to complete the mission that Jesus started. He said, I came to seek and save those who are lost, and now I'm going to empower you to do greater things in my name. You're going to soak through this tomorrow. Watch. But you will receive. Come on, come on. You will receive when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll just have a great time together, and you'll just rejoice and hoop and holler and then go out and not do anything. No. Actually, you will be my witnesses. Where? Where? Right here in Mount Juliet, right here in Lebanon, right here in Wilson County, and in Judea and Samaria, that's America, that's our region, and to the ends of the earth. That's why he wants to empower you. He wants to equip his church. What an amazing prayer. Descend on me, Holy Spirit. Comfort me. Teach me. Empower me. Equip me. Now we're in John 16. You're going to soak through this a week from today. And when he comes, here's the fourth, he will. He will convict. Jesus says this is a role of the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. Boy, I cannot tell you a good prayer to pray. Holy Spirit, point out anything in my life. Talk to me about anything in my life. Holy Spirit, comfort me. Holy Spirit, teach me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, convict me. And I know a lot of us, maybe we hear that word and we think, well, that, that makes me feel bad. No, that's condemnation. I'm talking about conviction. And the Holy Spirit never condemns. He only convicts. The devil condemns and reminds you and shames you, but the Holy Spirit never does that. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The word conviction simply means this, to point you in the way of life, to redirect your life towards something that is better for you. Conviction always results in a positive outcome because conviction always leads you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is always wanting to lead you to Jesus, which means when he convicts you, he's leading you to a more Christ-like life. That's something we need, everybody. So when you have that moment, 
that you're getting ready to do something. And he goes, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Have you ever had that moment? I mean, you guys are super spiritual. I have, I have these moments. And I get, to, I get ready to say something or respond a certain way. And the Holy Spirit goes, mm-mm, mm-mm, no. You're set apart. You're different. You stand in the righteousness of Christ. You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you that raised Jesus from the dead. You don't get to say that. And he's protecting me from myself. I need conviction. You need conviction. It's a role of the Holy Spirit drawing me to the person of Jesus. In fact, I can't get saved without the Holy Spirit drawing me. He says, except by the Holy Spirit, you will not gain access to Jesus. He draws you to the person of Jesus. He leads you to Jesus. So if I'm being convicted of sin in my life, I should be thankful because I'm taking another step towards Christ. I need that. I need a paracletos beside me, walking with me, pressed up against me, that points me in the direction of life. Here's a good prayer to pray. Oh, search me, Holy Spirit. Know my heart. Test me. Know my thoughts. I love this line. Point out anything in me that offends you. The Holy Spirit. Maybe, maybe you didn't know this is what he provides. It's not just an experience. Yes, we need experiences. Yes, we need encounters. But we don't become dependent upon the encounter. The encounter prepares us for the walk. The encounter prepares you for the wilderness moment that Jesus walked into. The encounter as he descended upon him prepared him for the wilderness moment so that he could resist the temptation of the devil. It tells us of no encounter or experience with the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. He has an encounter, he descends, and it says, and he was compelled by the same Spirit into the wilderness. Equipping him, empowering him. Search me, God. Know my heart. Comfort me, teach me. Empower me. Convict me. John 16. And when he, the Spirit of truth, comes... Now, this may be one of my favorite ones right here. They're all, they're all unbelievable. He will guide me. <laughs> Where? Into all truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you. Now, pause. He will speak, and he will tell. He is a speaking kind of God. He wants to talk to you. And watch. He will tell you things to come. That's amazing. Holy Spirit. Comfort me, teach me, empower me, convict me. Holy Spirit, guide me. Oh, I'm so thankful that he guides me, that he's my helper, that in the moments when I'm confused, I can hear a voice behind me saying, hey, son, I love you. Come on over here. In the temptation, challenging moment, he can go, hey, 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 I love you. Come to the way of life, son. Come to the better life that I have for you. Don't settle for that life. Oh, I need that in my life. Jesus actually said it was for our good that he would leave. Can you believe that? You're like, that can't be better. Jesus said, it's better for you that I leave. And we're like, no, nah, I want Jesus to show up. That'd be pretty cool. Imagine if Jesus showed up walking with you, hanging out with you just for a few days. Wouldn't that be awesome? Staying in the bonus room. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Walking in your neighborhood, dog runs out, car hits it, Jesus is with you, dog's walking. Fine, we're fine. It's amazing. You walk out, cat runs out, car hits it, Jesus goes, I got to be about my father's business. I can, sorry, I'm not doing that. true. I just believe that's true. I just believe that's true. Man, I just wish Jesus would show up and Jesus goes, actually, it's better for you. It's to your advantage. And watch, I'll send him to you. There's more for you. 
It's going to be hard for you to believe. It's to your advantage. You're better off. You know why? He's not weird. He just wants a relationship with you to comfort you, to teach you, to empower you, to convict you, to guide you. He is a person. One of my commentaries that I read from often. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he is a spirit and he has a soul. He intercedes for us and through us he hears, speaks, teaches, and guides us into truth. Thank you, God. He glorifies Christ in me. He reveals Christ to me. He brings all of Christ's words to my remembrance. And he shows us the things to come. He knows the deep things of God. Searches all things. Reveals all things. Where he is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. He inspired the writers of the Bible. He reveals the Son to us. We are convicted by him. Born again by him. Led by him. Filled by him. And sealed by him. In Jesus' name. And that is the person of the Holy Spirit. And he has so much more for you. to comfort you, to teach you, to empower you, to convict you, and to guide you. Let me pray for you this morning. Bow your heads here in the room. I know we're over time. I know, I know. But sometimes the Holy Spirit descends outside of our program and outside of our timeline and we could just create a couple minutes for him for the person of the Holy Spirit your heads are bowed here in the room maybe you're joining us online maybe you've never heard that this is what the Holy Spirit wants to provide in your life maybe you've, maybe you've never heard a message on the Holy Spirit maybe you've been okay with two thirds of God but Jesus says there's a comforter there's a teacher there's an equipper, there's a convictor, there's a guide that's available to you. And I just believe that the Holy Spirit, he loves you so much that he would be talking to you about an area of your life that you need to submit to God. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's for the first time you submitting your life to God. He's wanting to press up alongside you and lead you would you surrender? Maybe you've been serving the Lord a long time and you'd say, Devin, I, I don't relate to him that way, but I would love to. I want to know him in that way. I want to invite him. I, I want to embrace him. I, I'm inviting the Holy Spirit to descend on me. It's my hope for you because he has so much for you. You're here this morning, and maybe it's for the very first time. He's convicting you. He's not condemning you. He's not shaming you. He loves you. He's drawing you to the person of Jesus. Online, here in the room, you've been serving the Lord a long time, but you're like, Devin, I, I want to be equipped. I, I, I want to be empowered. I, I want to be led and guided. I, I, wanna, I want to have him descend on me, and I want to experience him in a way that I never have. If that's you this morning, Welcome to the journey of knowing who the person of the Holy Spirit really is. All over this room, come on and raise your hands all across this place. I just got a feel. Come on, y'all. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Come on, just lift them high to him and say, Holy Spirit, we want more of you. We need you. All across this room, see, see the hearts of your people as you descend upon us, Holy Spirit. And as you provide for us the comfort and the revelation and you empower us and you're convicting us you're calling us to more we love you for your conviction and you're guiding us and leading us some of you you've been confused it's been a it's been a it's been a dark path it's been a clouded path the holy spirit wants to guide you son this is the way walk in it the holy spirit we need you, we need you. All we need is more. We need you. We want more of you. Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. Come on in.
invite him. All we need is more. We need more. We want more of you. Holy Spirit, the truth, the living water. Rivers of living water, he would say in John chapter 7, flowing from out of your inner person. That he will breathe and he will move as he pleases. As he says in John 3, and he will lead you cloud by day, fire by night. Mighty rushing wind filling your sails and tongues of fire equipping you and empowering. 